Welcome. Today we are going to analyze the paper of J 2018 Advanced Physics. All right. What we are going to do is we are going to solve a bunch of problems and see which topic bore what kind of percentage in the paper, right? And the basic objective of this video is to see how to solve problems uh, quickly uh, in in the J paper, right? So I have right now a question in front of me. question reads the potential energy of a particle of mass m at a distance r from a fixed point o is given by this expression v of r equals to kr square by 2 so potential energy is a function of r and the function is kr square by 2 cool where k is a positive constant of appropriate dimensions this particle is moving in a circular orbit of radius capital r now capital r is different from small r about the point o if v is the speed of the particle and l is the magnitude of its angular momentum about o which of the following statements is and are true the first thing is this is a multiple answer question something you can figure out from the question itself and this question had partial markings right so let's see this this is a question of mechanics mechanics usually uh, bears a great percentage uh of questions in the je paper because you know a lot of chapters come under mechanics the, uh, in 2018 it was around 41% right so let's get into this problem so the first thing when i when i look at this problem i know there's a particle which is moving in a circle with a with the radius capital r okay let, let me draw that o there is a beautiful circle and a particle is moving around in that circle with a velocity v okay or speed v to be technically right because you know speed is v velocity keeps changing of course because velocity is a vector quantity now what do i know about a particle which is moving in a circle of uh, any radius i know that it has got to have a centripetal force right and that centripetal force the expression for that centripetal force is m v square upon capital r because it is moving in the circle of radius capital r right all right and uh, what would this be equal to what is providing the centripetal force so something always provides the centripetal force is the way that's the way we look at the centripetal force right what is providing that well i don't know but the question has given me potential energy it has given me v of r is equal to kr square by 2 and i know there's a link between potential energy and the force right there is a relationship between them and that relationship is f is equal to minus dv by dr so if you differentiate potential energy with respect to the 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 position that is with respect to r you would get the force all right so let let me find that so this becomes equal to minus of d by dr of my v is kr square by 2 k by 2 is a constant k by 2 would come out differential of r square with respect to r is 2r 2 to gets cancel i'll get minus k r as my answer a very smooth very easy differential nothing uh, extraordinary there all right so now force is equal to minus k r but it is not the, the 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 force the negative sign is of no use here right because the negative sign basically tells us that the force is acting in a direction in which r is decreasing right so if, uh, if r is increasing in that direction then the force is in the opposite direction we know already that the force is in that direction so that negative makes no sense i basically i need the magnitude of that force right because that's the force which is providing the centripetal force for the circular motion all right so let me do that so this mv square by r will be equal to uh, let me get rid of this negative will be equal to k times r right but actually it will not be k times smaller because i know smaller is a variable i know that at on the circle while uh, rotating about that point right or while revolving around that point let me be uh, more precise while revolving around that point the value of smaller is capital r so this will be k times of not smaller but r capital okay so now i have got an expression mv square by r is equal to kr and if i just do a little manipulation here v square will become k times of r square by m and v will become equal to uh, root k by m times the big r 
so that is my velocity all right let me check uh, a doesn't seem to be correct because there's a 2 here so the right answer is b b is equal to root over k by m times r now we also have to find the angular momentum now for that you need to know the expression for angular momentum and the expression for angular momentum is let me do it here it is l is equal to m v r right for something which is moving in a circle so that becomes equal to m and v is something we just found out we are going to use that exploit that result under root of k by m times capital r and the value of small r here is again capital r because we are talking about a circle of radius capital r right don't get confused there small r is a variable capital r is the radius and all these analysis which we are doing is we are doing at the distance of radius from that point o so this becomes uh, this uh, root m and this root will become make this root m so this will become root over k m times r square which is option number c okay so for this question the correct options were option b and option c let's look at another problem from mechanics A planet of mass m has two natural satellites with masses m1 and m2. The radii of their circular orbits are r1 and r2 respectively. Ignore the gravitational force between the satellites. Define uh, v1, l1, k1 and t1 to be respectively the orbital speed, the angular momentum, the kinetic energy and the time period of revolution of satellite 1 and v2, l2, k2, t2 to be the same for satellite 2. Given m1 by m2 is equal to 2 and r1 by r2 is equal to 1 by 4 match the ratios of the list 1 to the numbers in the list 2 okay this is what we have got to do and this and this is given to us all right let's start with the velocity now what do i know about velocity i know that the satellite is moving around the planet and the, the satellite is when, when a satellite moves around the planet the orbit can be considered nearly circular it is almost circular right and if it is, uh, if they have not specifically mentioned that it is not, you have to consider it to be circular. And if there is something which is moving in a circular uh, trajectory, if it is moving in a circular path, the one thing which I know is that the centripetal force will be equal to mv square by r, right? There, ha there will be a centripetal force and that will be equal to mv square by r and it will be provided by some other force. And what force provides centripetal force in case of two objects, two planets or satellite moving to, uh, around each other? That's only one force going on there, right? That's the gravitational force. So this will be equal to G times M times, this is mass of the planet, times M times mass of the satellite, divided by R squared, right? And now, I can cut out this 2, this R from here, this small m, and I get value of V to be equal to root over G M by R, right? That's the value of V. Uh, in terms of r so now what would that become so that makes v equals to or v1 by v2 we can directly write equal to root over r2 by r1 a simple ratio right and because we know r1 by r2 is equal to 1 by 4 r2 by r1 becomes equal to 4 and root of 4 is equal to 2 so v1 by v2 is equal to 2 and that means p goes to 3 right Let's look at the next thing, uh, L1 by L2, that is the ratio of angular momentum. So now angular momentum about the center is given by MVR, right, MVR. So L is equal to MVR, that implies M L1 by L2 will be equal to M1 V1 R1 by M2 V2 R2. And I know the value of M1 by M2, which is equal to 2. I know the value of V1 by V2, which I just found out to be 2 again and the value of r1 by r2 is 1 by 4 so that becomes 1 by 4 this whole thing becomes equals to a good number 1 okay so this guy l1 by l2 goes to 2 all right and next is k1 by k2 that is the ratio of their kinetic energies okay let me use this space over here to find that 
So K1 by K2 ratio of the kinetic energies will be equal to half m1 v1 squared by another half m2 v2 squared. Right? That will become m1 by m2 times v1 by v2 whole squared. Half and half will get cancelled. m1 by m2 I know is 2. v1 by v2 again I know is 2. And there's a square there. This becomes equals to 8. So K1 by K2 goes to 8. All right. Next question is the ratio of the time periods. And how would I find the ratio of time periods? Is there something which relates time period to these other quantities, to, to the speed or to the radius or to the uh, angular momentum? Well, one thing comes to my mind is the Kepler's third law, which says that the square of the time period of a revolving body is proportional to the cube of its radius, right? And if I know this, I can do this T1 Q square by T2 square equal to R1 cube by R2 cube. The ratio of the time periods will go like this between these two satellites, right? So this will become, this will give us T1 by T2 equal to R1 by R2 whole to the power of 3 by 2. And what does that become? So this becomes uh, R1 by R2 is 1 by 4. So 1 by 4 whole to the power of 3 by 2. That means 1 by 4 whole to the power of 1 by 2, that's 1 by 4, that's the root of 1 by 4, that's 1 by 2. And then whole to the power of 3, that becomes 1 by 8. So that is equal to 1 by 8. And so S goes to 1. So P goes to 3, Q goes to 2, R goes to 4, and S goes to 1. And so the correct option is B. After mechanics, the topic that bears the greatest percentage weightage in uh, J paper is electrodynamics. And that is because a lot of chapters fall inside it. Okay. And in 2018 paper, the weightage it had was around 23%, close to 23%. All right. So here I have a problem from electrodynamics, okay, to solve and let's look at this problem. A particle of mass 10 to the power of minus 3 kilogram and charge 1 coulomb is initially at rest. At time t is equal to 0, the particle comes under the influence of an electric field E of t which is equal to E naught sine omega t times i, alright, where E naught is equal to 1 newton per coulomb and omega is equal to 10 to the power of 3 radius per second. Consider the effect of only the electrical force on the particle, then maximum speed in meters per second attained by the particle at the subsequent times is. When I read this problem, the key takeaway from this problem is that the electric field is given uh, as a function of time, it's not a constant, and I have to find the maximum speed. That's why I have understood uh, the charge value is given, and initially this charge was, was at rest, I know that. Let me try to do that. So I know the electric field to be E naught sine of omega t times i cap that means that it is in the positive x direction but because sine itself changes its value from positive to negative uh, so the electric field can also be come to the negative x direction or uh, because you are on the camera this is positive for you and this is negative for you so from positive it can come to negative right uh, that that is possible, but I'm not worried about its direction, right? Right now, I'm just worried about uh, if I if I have the electrical field, uh, what can I do with it? So, if I want to find velocity, if I want to find speed, I have to somehow get into uh, what is speed related to? It's related to acceleration, and acceleration is related to force, and force is related to electrical field. So, I have to work this thing backwards. Uh, electric field is this. What will be the electrical force? That will be Q times E naught sine of omega t. And if I have the force, what will be the acceleration? Acceleration will be force by mass, which will, will be equal to Q times E naught by m sine of omega t. We know acceleration is equal to dv by dt, right? Rate of change of velocity. Now that makes dv by dt equal to Q E naught by M times sine of omega T, right? Now, this makes the dV is equal to Q E naught by M sine of omega T times dt. 
and now comes the interesting part where we have to integrate this thing so i'm going to integrate it on both the sides and when you integrate one of the most important things that you have to keep in mind are the limits so the limit of v goes from where to where what's the initial velocity what's the initial speed the initial speed is zero because it had started from rest so zero to some speed v which i don't know what that is and initial time was zero to some time t so i'm assuming here that at time small t the speed was v all right now let's go ahead uh, and integrate this so this becomes equal to q times e naught by m that's a constant that comes out integration of sine omega t becomes minus uh, cos omega t right and that would run from zero to t so when i do that what do i get when i do that i get uh, minus q e naught by m i plug in t i get cos omega t and when i plug in zero i get one so this is what i get right cos omega t minus one but we have forgotten something when you integrate cos omega t you won't just get sorry when you integrate sin omega t you won't just get minus cos omega t you'd get minus cos omega t divided by omega also right because whatever is the multiple of the argument that gets divided so that is important one of my students forgot to do this and because of this he got a wrong answer and struggled with it for a long time because he just forgot how, like that one small little thing about integration and he knew the problem very well so integer type problems are extremely uh, you need to be extremely careful while doing them right one mistake and and you will not get to that right number or you get to a wrong number which is worse all right so this becomes so i can write this as q e naught by m omega times 1 minus cos omega t this is my final expression over here okay so what does this mean this expression q e naught when i look at this expression i am supposed to find out what is the maximum value of this expression right what is the maximum value this expression can attain that's that's what i'm trying to find out because that would be the maximum speed. Now, I see that this guy here is a constant. Q e naught by m is not going to change. The only variable here is cos omega t, right? As t changes, cos omega t will change. Now, you have got this. You've got a constant times 1 minus cos omega t. So, the, the smaller the value cos omega t will have, the bigger will be the value of 1 minus cos omega t. Because from 1, you're subtracting something. The thing which you're subtracting from 1, the little it is, the bigger is this value which you're multiplying it with the bigger is the number so i want cos omega t to be as small as possible and what is the smallest possible value of cos omega t that's zero right and if i put zero i'll get q e naught by m and that will be a wrong answer and again one of my students told me that he did that mistake uh, he thought that cos the minimum value is zero but that's not true because the minimum value that cos can take is not zero it is minus one okay Remember, cos goes from minus 1 to plus 1, sine goes from minus 1 to plus 1 as well. So, minus 1 is the minimum value that cos omega t can take. And if I plug in minus 1, I get q e naught by m, 1 minus of minus 1, that's 2. So, it is equal to 2 q e naught by m, and where's my omega? Omega should also be there, yeah. Omega is there. I don't want to make the mistake of not putting omega. I'll be repeating that. So, 2 times of the value of q is 1, the value of e naught is uh, 1 again and I am being very careful, everything is an SI unit, otherwise I would have to convert it into SI units. Divided by m, where is my m? m is 10 to the power of minus 3 and omega is 10 to the power of 3, that is beautiful, they get cancelled and answer is equal to 2. So, I would go to the all the bubbles, I'll, I'll fill the bubble that says 2 and that's how you solve an integer type problem in J advanced. That was a problem from electrodynamics. Now let's look at a problem from waves. It bore a 10% weightage in the paper and usually around 10 to 12% is the weightage of waves. So I have here a question from sound waves. Okay, and let me read that out. Two men are walking along a horizontal straight line in the same direction. The man in front walks at the speed of 1 meters per second and the man behind walks at the speed of 2 meters per second. 
A third man is standing at a height 12 meter above the same horizontal line such that all three men are in vertical plane. So man one, man two and the third man, they're all in the same plane. Makes sense. Uh, now what? The two walking men are blowing identical vessels which emit a sound of particular frequency 1430 Hz. The speed of the sound in air is given as 330 meters per second. At the instant when the moving men are 10 meters apart, so they're because they keep they keep moving, so there'll be some instant when they're exactly 10 meters apart, the stationary man is equidistant from them. And that's beautifully given in the diagram as well. So I don't have to like imagine everything. Uh, okay, the frequency of beats in hertz heard by the stationary man at, at this instant is take G to be this much. Okay, so what beats will this guy hear? Now, the first question is why does anyone hear beats? People hear beats because they're hearing two frequencies which are uh, which which are different by a small margin. So if there's a frequency F1 and there's a frequency F2 and, uh, and if, they, if there's a difference in them that they're not exactly equal, then the difference of the, the two frequencies that is F1 minus F2 is the beat that you hear, right? But the question is, here the two men are blowing the whistles at exactly the same frequency which is 1430 Hz. Then why would a man on top hear any beats? Because both the frequencies that he would hear would be the same. But that's not true, right? Because these two men are also moving. So whenever a source or an observer moves, right, relative to each other, the frequency of the sound waves change and that's called Doppler effect. And we have got a nice formula for that. And the formula for Doppler effect is the new frequency heard by the observer is equal to V plus minus VO upon V minus plus VS times F, where V is the speed of the sound plus VO is the speed of the observer, VS is the speed of the source. So, so the, my, my, the, the way I remember it, my thumb rule is if either source or observer are coming close. So when source and observer are coming close to each other, the frequency increases. If they're going far apart, the frequency decreases. One, one clarity. Coming close increases, going far decreases. Okay, cool. But sometimes it may ha so happen that the source is fixed and just the observer is moving. In that case, what you do? The source is fixed. Vs becomes zero. So you get V because the observer is coming closer, the frequency is to, has to increase. So you get you take the sign on the top, which is you take V plus VO upon V times F so that you get a bigger frequency. And when the when the when the source when the let's say the observer is fixed and the source is moving closer, in that case again the frequency would increase, but VO will be zero. But in a denominator, you take V upon V minus Vs because that will make the whole thing bigger than one. Okay. And if you don't want to think about anything, just remember that when things come closer, you take the sign on the top, which is either plus or minus, right? Depending on what is moving, what is not. And when things go apart, you take the sign on the bottom. Cool. All right. Now let's, let's do this. So here the observer is not moving. The observer is on the top. He's like fixed. The sources are moving. So now let's first find out F1 dash. That is the uh, frequency of man one, the one meter per second man. Okay, so the one meter per second man has what uh, frequency? That will be equal to V, and uh, there's no VO divided by V minus VS times F. Okay, F we know 1430, V is 330, and VS is one meters per second, right? I'll just plug those values in and I'll get the answer, but that's not right because although the observer, uh, sorry, although the source, the whistler is moving with one meters per second, but that one meters per second is not in the line joining the the source, the, not in the line joining the source to the uh, observer. So the velocity has to be, or the speed has to be in the line line joining the source and the observer. So what would I have to do? I'll have to find the component of this speed or this velocity. You cannot find component of speed. You can only find component of velocity. So you can you have to find I have to find the component of this velocity in that line along that line so let me let me find that out so one meter per second is what i've got here and if i resolve it i get here one cos of theta this angle is theta and here i'll get one sine of theta so one sine theta is the perpendicular velocity i don't I'm not, i don't worry about that i don't have to worry about that all i have to worry about is one cos theta and one cos theta to find that i need theta and what will theta be so when i look at this diagram uh, 
if I draw a line like this, then theta will be this height divided by this height. So horizontal I know is five because it, they are exactly, uh, you know, the, the observer is exactly midway between them. And I don't know this height. What will I do for that? So when I got this problem, I, I gave it like 30, 40 seconds to find out how would I find that height. And I couldn't find out that height because I realized that for to find that height, you need to know the, the height of those men who are walking. And the question doesn't give that. Okay. So the question is going with an intrinsic assumption that this, those two men are like point objects. Okay. This is something you have to figure out from your own smartness. If you don't do that, you'll just go into this loop of finding out the exact value of theta and you will not be able to find that. So be a little smart and understand that they are actually point objects. It means that this distance is actually equal to this whole distance that is 12. So cos of theta will be equal to for that I need this is 5 this is 12 then I need this distance this will be equal to 5 square plus 12 square the whole root so that will be 25 plus 144 under root of that will be uh, 25 plus 144 is 169 and under root of 169 is 13 that's perfect so this is a 5 12 13 triangle so my cos theta becomes equal to cos theta is equal to 5 by 13 all right so cos theta is equal to 5 by 13 so this value becomes v which is 330 divided by 330 minus 5 by 13 because 1 times cos theta is 5 by 13 times 1430 okay this is the frequency of the first walking men right but i have committed a mistake here i don't know if you if you spotted it when i found the component of this velocity i found that this component of this velocity is going against or uh, away from the source the source is over here and this velocity is going like this away right so i shouldn't use a negative in the denominator because the overall frequency should decrease because you know the source and observer are, are, are going up are growing apart so in that case my formula should not be v minus vs it should be v plus vs okay so this will be plus so that's a mistake you don't have to commit now let's commit come to the second uh, man the man who's walking with uh, two meters per second so his velocity is two meters per second i'll resolve it i'll get here two cos theta which is two times of five by thirteen that will be ten by thirteen so 10 by 13, but it is towards the source. So I have to use negative in the denominator. I know that. So F2 dash will be equal to V upon V minus Vs times F, which is 330 upon 330 minus uh, 10 by 13 times uh, F, which is 1430. Okay. And now I have to find the beat. So the beat frequency will be F1 dash minus F2 dash. That will be equal to 330 upon 330 plus 5 by 13 times 1430 minus 330 upon 330 minus 10 by 13 into 1430 so you have to subtract these two numbers that you have gotten to find the beat frequency in fact you should subtract this from this because bigger from the smaller number and when you do that and you do this ca calculation carefully and do this do this ca carefully because this is an integer type problem again you get an answer very close to 5 okay uh, and so that's the answer for this problem so this problem took me a little longer to solve because i was also explaining you the doppler effect in between and all those things uh, otherwise this would take almost half the time that i took to solve it all right but i hope that you have learned a few things uh, um, observing me solve this problem now let's look at another problem from j 2018 paper and this is from modern physics now in 2018, the percentage weightage of modern physics was also around 10 and 12 percentage, between 10 and 12. But usually modern physics bears a good percentage and because modern physics is considered easy and my, I suggest that it is easy because the problems can be quickly solved and the concepts are not very convoluted. Uh, it's a good idea to always attempt problems of modern physics and uh, to never leave modern physics out, okay? So let me do this problem. In a radioactive decay chain, thorium-232 nucleus decay into lead-212 nucleus. Let n alpha and n beta be the number of alpha and beta particles, respectively, emitted in this decay process. All right. Which of the following statements is or are true? So it's a multi-multi-answer uh, question. 
Now let me try this. So what's given to us is thorium 232.90 gets converted into lead 212.82 plus some alpha particle. Alpha particle is basically the nucleus of helium. So alpha particle is uh, helium uh, 24. The atomic number is 2. So not the atomic number, the nuclear mass, right? Because it's not an atom. So the uh, the the charge is 2, right? And the, uh, the mass uh, of this nucleus, the nuclear mass is 4 plus some beta particle which are electrons. So they, they don't have any mass because th their mass is very less compared to other nucleons and the charge they carry is negative, right? So it's uh, you can call it minus 1 or you can also write this as E minus 1, right? That's an electron, you know that. Now, how would I balance? So, you, because electron doesn't have any mass, so whatever mass difference is appearing between these two equations has to come from the alpha particle. So, let's see, 232 we have got here and here we have got 212. That's a difference of 20 uh, nuclear masses. So, 20 uh, is the difference and uh, I have got, uh, if I have got one alpha particles, I've got four. So, how many alpha particles would I need to compensate for that? I would need five because 5 times 4 is 20, so 212 plus 5 times 4, 20 becomes 232. So mass on LHS is equal to the mass on RHS, that's balanced. What about charge? Here I have charge of 90, here I have charge of 82, plus 5 times 2 is 10, that is 92, I have a charge of 92. So that's more than the, the charge we have left hand side. Right? Left hand side I have 90 and right hand side I have 92. So I need to decrease, I need some negative charge. I need to decrease it by 2. And for that we have got beta particles because we get beta particles are negatively charged. They, de they decrease the, the, the charge, right? The charge value. So if it is 92, I, if I just have two beta particles, I'll get minus two and that'll become equal to 90. So charge will also be balanced on both, both sides. So in any radioactive reaction, what you have got to do is balance the masses and balance the charge because charge and mass both cannot be created nor can be destroyed because of the conservation law. Now I can directly jump into the, I think I found the answer. So alpha particles are five and beta particles are two. So A and C are the right answer and that's how you solve a problem from uh, modern physics, okay? So this was an analysis of J 2018 paper and watch out for us for analysis of other papers as well. For more videos and live lectures on the JEE, click on the subscribe button now.